Let's do that hockey. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dauber Prospects Radio. I'll be your host for this episode again. My name is Peter Harling. If this is your first time tuning in to my podcast, it's great to have you here. Thanks very much. We're going to talk some fantasy hockey on episode 118, specifically focused on the 2022 NHL entry draft. Um, if you are a longtime listener to the show, thanks for coming back. Really appreciate you uh, being a fan of the show. If you haven't already, go ahead and give us a five-star review on iTunes or whatever platform you listen to. Share an episode on Twitter if you listen to it and you like it. Just kind of help spread the love, make the show a little bit more discoverable. Uh, I'm going to welcome my guest at this time, and he's becoming a bit of a regular here because I just love chatting prospects with him so much. Uh, welcome back, Victor Nuno. How you doing? I'm doing awesome, Peter. Thanks so much for having me. Really, uh, really enjoyed the article you wrote on this on this uh, draft rankings, and so great, uh, excited to talk about it. Yeah, me too. Uh, thank you so much for contributing. You know, it's um, can't make the consensus ranking without input from a number of, of different people. And uh, you guys on your own podcast, Fantasy Hockey Life, kind of touched on this a little bit on your latest episode. Um, you talked about how your ranking varied a little bit from the consensus. So if anyone wants to, after they listen to this episode, circle around. If you haven't ever listened to the Fantasy Hockey Life show with, with Victor, then you gotta, you gotta check that out. It's, it's good stuff. Their production value is way better than mine. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> um, so for anyone who hasn't uh, read the article for what we're talking about today, I'll give you a, a, the Coles Notes version on what it is. That's a very Canadian reference. Um, so what I do every year for Dauber Prospects is a consensus ranking fantasy value for the upcoming NHL entry draft. So there's a lot of places out there that do different rankings. Um, and they're all very good, right? You can find them on TSN, Sportsnet, McKean's, uh, Hockey Prospect, Dauber Prospects, the Hockey Writers, uh, you name it. And, and they're all they're all good. All the, the people that do these rankings do their homework. But the only one that I can act find is the one that I do. And that is uh, one that's fantasy hockey focused. And, you know, I was searching for one for for a couple of years until I just said, well, I guess if you want something done, you got to do it yourself. <laughs> so I went ahead and started making this for Dauber Prospects. One of the things I like about it is it's not my fantasy ranking. That's part of it. I, I do my own fantasy ranking for the draft, but I uh, I elicit the help of a number of other writers from a number of other platforms, as well as a couple of people from Dauber Prospects too, to give you a really comprehensive idea of what the fantasy value of the players in the upcoming draft are. And the results don't vary too much from the NHL uh, rankings, just the, the straightforward draft rankings um, but they are different and depending on your league format um, there can be some some differences there in how you would want to value it so this ranking should basically for the most part probably just be a template use it as a starting point or a guide and then depending on what your teams or your league's scoring or preferences are then you can adjust accordingly um, but this is a really good starting point to give you an idea. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I'd like to kind of start to get into this with you, Victor. Um, so I had contributions from myself, yourself, Scott Wheeler from The Athletic, Russ Cohen from Elite Prospects, Brock Otten from McKean's, Steve Ellis from The Hockey News, uh, Nick Richard and E2 Siltanen. Uh, join me from Dauber Prospects as well to give us uh, about six or seven, whatever it was, writers there that that contributed overall. And the way the rankings worked is I got everyone's rankings and then I gave every player a score based on where they were ranked. Right? So for my list, I had Shane Wright number one. So that was one point. And he ended up scoring 11 points overall, which means that at least one of the writers didn't rank him number one. We'll get to that. And then, uh, and then so on and so forth. So someone that I ranked 32nd scored 32 points. So the overall rankings went 
uh, 11 points, 35, 36, 37, 29. And you can see that all broken down uh, in the article. I, I, I pointed out how many overall ratings or points each player had. So you can kind of see the tiers as well, which I thought is always something that's really helpful. Uh, so some of the things, Victor, that I take into consideration when I'm doing my ranking are what is their upside? What's the best case scenario for this player? And I also look at, I have positional bias. Uh, I give a higher value to centers and then to forwards and then to defense. And that's just basically based on the leagues that I'm in and my own personal fantasy hockey experience when, you know, defense just don't move the needle enough for me to invest a lot of capital and either cap space or or draft capital into them either. Cause you know, there's, there's only a few out there, uh, Eric Carlson's and Brent Burns and Kale McCars that really rack up the points. And then, and then after that, it becomes a pretty, pretty evenly shallow pool after that top tier there. Um, so those are some of the things that that I look at and I value in my rankings. Uh, I also I also took in the Russian factor into account in this year's rankings as well, which is kind of something that's new. The the Russian factor has been a diminishing concept in hockey for a number of years now, since it was a really big thing in the eighties, uh, almost to the point where yeah, basically I dismissed it. I didn't really recognize the Russian factor when doing my rankings anymore. But based on the political landscape today. Uh, I think it it needs to be a factor. Um, so that was kind of some of the things that I took into consideration. Uh, what were you looking at when you did your rankings? A lot of the same things, you know, really well said. I don't, I don't think that's going to be a surprise that I had had sort of a similar process. I, I did try really hard not to look at other people's lists because I didn't want to be too influenced, but you know, that with some of these guys, it's going to happen. Um, I, I definitely like to, think about and and rank based on upside. So I don't necessarily just want to have the guy who's going to be safe, right? Like a, like an NHLer, but uh, maybe, maybe a third liner or something. I in general would rather take the guy who has a 25% chance of being a first or second liner than the guy that has like an 80% chance of being a bottom sixer. Uh, I think in, in fantasy, those, guys that have a really high likelihood of being a bottom sixer are kind of just waste your time, waste your roster space. And it's not really that helpful to draft them. Uh, Although certainly at times having in dynasty, having those NHLers just, you know, put up some numbers is useful, but that's kind of the process I look at. I wanted to see who has like maybe an, an elite or near elite skill that can vault them into potentially being a high end impact player at the NHL. I also definitely looked at positions and this draft in particular, I've been saying for a couple of years is the draft to get defensemen. So unsurprisingly, I had several defensemen in the top 20, whereas I don't think the consensus had as many. And I also like to put a little bit of preference to the wingers because um, that is often a little bit harder to get high end value. Although it wasn't a huge deal in this, in this draft, because there aren't that many good centers. It seems like usually there's a lot of decent centers and um, I might fade one or two of them just because I I might might want to get a higher end winger, but that really wasn't as big of a deal in this draft because uh, there are only a few, you know, pretty decent to high end centers. So that was kind of, that was kind of my process. I know sometimes it it takes longer to wait on defensemen, you know, um, but in certain cases, especially the top two in this draft that are already playing professionally against men, I feel like that's going to be less of an issue. And then, of course, we didn't have this issue in this year's draft, but it has been in the past where you got to think about goalies, perhaps going in the in the top round. But that's not really there isn't really one of those in, in this year's draft. So we didn't have to have that um, argument or disagreement, which was kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I I take into consideration when doing positional value is just because a player plays center at the junior level doesn't mean he's going to be a center when he makes it to the NHL. Uh, In fact, it is a good probability that as they move up into the pro level, they move over to the wing. 
um, at least to start their career, right? They might make their way back in into the pivot position as they get a little bit more tenured. Uh, but there's a lot more responsibility on the center ice position. And it just, it's just an easier transition on the wing, right? Like playing wing is the easiest position in hockey, right? Because if you mess up, you got your defenseman to bail you out. And then if they mess up, they got the goalie to bail them out. And by the time it goes in the net, it's like, well, you know, hey, there's two other people between me and when that went and it's not my fault. Um, and then the center has a lot more defensive responsibilities uh, than the wingers too. The wingers just got to cover their point. Uh, that That's fair. Um, just one point on that though. There are some of those centers or even forwards that you might say who are pretty good two-way. And that's something that in a fantasy draft, I, I sometimes shy away with, shy away, shy away from, unless you're talking about like kind of middle rounds, like maybe it's your, your second or third or later round pick and, and you want that guy with the higher floor, but you know what I mean? Like those guys that, that are, that are good two way, uh, I think like Fedor Svechkov last year, um, you know, it's like, okay, he's probably going to get that assignment and, and maybe there won't be a whole lot of points. So for fantasy, I might fade that a little bit. Yeah, and context is is king, right? When you look at those players that are dubbed two way players, and you know that's that's always a bit of a turnoff for me when I see that. It's like, okay, so this is a two way player. They're going to be second line center, best, maybe not get the best offensive deployment. But what what do you know about that two way game that they're dubbed for playing? Is that because that's they're eighteen year old and they're playing? you know, in the Liga or the KHL or SHL. And they're not going to get the prime offensive deployment because they're 17 years old. So if they want to play in that league, they have to play a two-way game. That doesn't mean that they don't have the chops to play uh, once they become a, a man, once they grow up and, and make it to the NHL, that they don't have the, the skill set and the vision to play in a, in a top line role in the NHL. I just look at Anton Lundell. There's a great example of that. He, his draft year, he was a two way Miko Koivu kind of, kind of player, right. And not really considered to be an offensive juggernaut. And now that he's playing in, in the NHL, he's gone from the Liga to the NHL. He's, he's scoring at a pretty impressive rate. He's exceeding my expectations. And, you know, I live in Canada, so I, I didn't get to watch a lot of them play, but uh, you know, there's a couple of people that, that were a little bit more in tune with that file and they're not surprised that he's, he's having an offensive output like that. So that's context is key. So it's good to, to, to read as much as you can about the prospects that, you know, that you've got your eye on and, and just kind of try and figure out exactly what that means. If they're a two way player, is that because they're they're They don't process the game fast enough they're, They don't have the creative vision. They don't have the hands and the, the skill set to be productive at the higher level, or is it, they just don't have the opportunity or that's just not what their coach is asking them to do at this time. Um, what about a couple of things like size and grittiness? Do you take into consideration sort of the bangers factor? Is, is this a player that's going to, you know, produce offensively. And if they're also a hitter and a scrapper, did that, does that move the needle for you on your fantasy rankings? I guess it would depend on your format. eh? And then what about their size? Does it, do you, do you skate with the tape measure or do you, do you mind if they're five foot, 10, 170 pounds? Yeah. Let's take the first one first. I, 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 it was my understanding that these are points only rankings. So that's how I, that's how I went about this one. So that definitely changed my ranking. So if I were going to be ranking these based on perifs, they would have changed a little bit for some of them. Some of them would have went way up. Some of them would have went a little down. And so absolutely that matters. You have to know your lead context. So really important. And one of the things that, that I do with, the, with, with my rankings uh, through our Patreon at Fantasy Hockey Life is I have peripheral categories. Like if you want to know who's going to hit, who's going to block, who's going to shoot, um, that stuff's kind of hard to find. And I have that available. So if anyone's interested in that, you can check that out. I know, I don't really know of any other place that has that. Yeah. <laughs> Peace right in his hand. Um, it's pretty hard to find that information. It's not really readily accessible. So that absolutely is a big deal because you just don't know. You look at these players and you're like, 
cool points um which is one of the biggest drivers for like nhl equivalency and all that and it, and it's and it's for real but as you said context is so important and some of sometimes you know you look under the hood and the guy shoots like once or maybe twice a game and sometimes he's shooting five or six times and of course it depends on what league you're in too uh, if it's a junior league or if it's khl league or whatever so that matters a lot uh, for for different leagues and and just know your settings the other thing you mentioned about size Size can really matter, right? I mean, I think two of the best examples in this year's draft are the WHL guys, right? You have the monstrous Connor that doesn't play like a big guy, kind of plays a little, well, not super physical. I don't, I wouldn't say he plays small, but he just he doesn't use his physicality to the uh, to the highest potential. And then Matty Savoy, who's tiny. Um, and but doesn't really let it bother him. He has other issues, but he doesn't really that doesn't get in his way so much. He's not averse to the contact. And and you look at some of the other small guys that uh, you know. I mean, Marco Rossi hasn't quite entered the league yet, but you know, the, his his strength and the way he was able to hold off players in the CHL was a little bit um, you know made you a little less concerned about that. So it kind of depends on how they play. Do they shy? Are they small and they shy away from contact? They stay on the perimeter. Or do they score from in front of the net? And do they get in deep? And do they do they actually like is their wall game okay? Like are they going to be able to survive against big defensemen in the NHL? Um, I think so. It depends. Forwards, it's often a little less concerning if they do those things. Smaller defensemen, you know, you see these five nine, five ten guys, and uh, you know, are they going to be able to pin forwards against the boards and, and steal the puck from them and and compete in front of the net? That's a bit of a concern. Because that's just the reality of the game, right? Like you have to be able to do those things, at least to some extent, right? You, even even guys like Devon Taves, who are clearly amazing at transition play, you still have to play in front of your net and along the boards at times, right? You're not going to get away from it completely. So if if you are, if you do want to be a player like Taves, uh, then you have to be near elite at the other parts, right? The transition play. So that's always the question: is like, okay, he's a good skater, he's good in transition, but is he like so good that it doesn't matter that his board play sucks and that he's not very physical. That's always a hard question to answer, right? Yeah. For me, I think the the context comes into it big time here again, because you can have a player that's short or a player that's a monster. And to me, it, it doesn't really matter. What matters is what do they, how do they play? How do they impact the game? Right? So you can be a five foot 10, 170 pound defenseman, but if you skate really well, like you've got great uh, quickness and agility and, and, and edges and you can, and you're smart, right. And you can position players uh, away from where they want to be out of the danger zones. And you've got a good active stick. You don't need to, to be a lumberjack out there to, you know, you don't have to destroy the player. You just have to disrupt the play. You just have to take away his options. Right. And then conversely for players that are really big, that's great that you're six foot four, 210 pounds. But if you don't use it, then it's useless. If you're not crushing guys and you're not intimidating and you're not using your, your size and your strength to protect the puck and, and be a juggernaut and that you just can't pick, knock you down or you don't have to go around guys. You can just go through them if, if there's no easier path. Um, so those are some of the things that I look at for size. Um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, another thing that I, I try to find out and take into consideration is versatility. Uh, if a player has got a number of, a number of injuries on his, on his resume, by the time he's coming into the draft, that's a bit of a red flag for me too. And there's different degrees of, of concern there with whatever injuries they've had. Some of them are, you know, like if they were out with mono, like that doesn't matter and that doesn't move the needle on me but if they missed you know a series of of games because of a couple of concussions that's a huge problem concussions and knees and shoulders those those are some things that can be uh chronic and reoccurring injuries um what kind of uh value do you put on their their versatility and durability I, I totally agree with you. It depends on what kind of injury. There are kinds that are 
you know, well, let me just say this. I think staying healthy as an athlete is a skill. It's generally not random, although it can be, as you mentioned, like getting an illness, uh, especially in the, in the land of COVID and certain traumas. Like I thinking about Quinn Byfield, who, you know, had his feet kind of knocked out from under him, went into the boards and broke his ankle. That was not his fault. There was nothing he could have done about that to prevent it. But there are there are aspects that are preventable, right? You hear guys who, you know, maybe pulled a groin or, you know, had some, uh, you know, some sort of shoulder or wrist thing, and and maybe it was a lack of strength and conditioning and, and being in tip top shape to prevent that from happening. So there are aspects of that that are skill based and that do require being, um, being, you know, prepared and being in, in the best shape. So, and for a lot of those guys, when you hear it's like similar thing, you know, repetitive, that's where you start to get really concerned. But if it's kind of, uh, you know, trauma related that uh, was, you know, from from a hit or some sort of collision, and, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily something they could have done about it or an illness, then uh, you kind of just chalk that up. I think sometimes the whole Band-Aid boy tag gets applied a little bit too quickly on some guys. I think we've got to give them a little bit more slack and see what's, uh, you know, until until we know for sure, until we see a repetitive bat pattern that sort of seems like it could have been preventable, then maybe we can apply that tag. Right, right, right. Um, all right, so let's let's start talking about the players in this draft a little bit more. Um, one last overall thought on it. Um, I think this is a pretty pretty shallow and a pretty weak draft, top to bottom. Uh, you know, you, you look at your first round. And I'm thinking if I'm a fantasy team, I'm thinking about pulling the plug and, and going on a full on rebuild. This might not be the year to do it. Uh, if I'm no. if I'm doing that, at least I, I'm trading for draft picks. They're going to be 2023 picks. Uh, that's a whole the 2023 draft is a whole nother episode. But um, and I mean, even right at the top, you've got Shane Wright on on the consensus ranking. Um, I'm not sure he's got the sort of fantasy upside that you want to build your focus, your rebuild around. I'm a hundred percent convinced he's a surefire NHL player. I think this is a guy that's going to play in the NHL starting in October and he's going to play for, you know, over a decade. That doesn't mean that he's going to be a hundred point producer though. Um, What's your thoughts on, on this overall draft class? I I agree with you relatively weak with some, good decent you know actual players but in terms of fantasy i would absolutely kick the can down the road i've been telling people for years get your 2023 first don't worry about 22 um 21 was a little bit weak um 20 was obviously pretty good but uh, it's hard to know that far in advance but i think it's pretty clear now that a top five pick in 23 is going to be way better than first overall this year um for for a lot of people and i think as I mentioned earlier, get your defenseman this year. I think you could draft the fourth, fifth, sixth defenseman off the board this year and might be better than, than other options that you could get, even in 23. So um, that's something that I'm looking for is a market inefficiency to try to get uh, maybe some, some extra defensemen this year. Um, and I also, I, I'm sure we'll talk more about Shane Wright too, but you have to sort of detach from how good the player will be as an NHLer versus how good they will be on your fantasy team. And sometimes it's really hard to escape some of that hype um, because he is a he is a really good player. I'm just not sure that he's going to be that great of a fantasy asset for you. So it's one of those things where if I had like the first or second or even third overall pick, I would try to trade down. So if I had the first overall pick, I would trade that for like the fifth and seventh pick or fifth and eighth or even sixth and ninth or something like that. I would take a couple of later first round picks in this draft or, or a later. lottery pick for 23. Well, that's a no brainer, but I'm talking about <laughs> if someone won't give you that, which they shouldn't, but maybe they would. Um, I well, would someone, take a someone who lives in Kingston picks. might. <laughs> well, there you go. Trade them to your, <laughs> to your friendly uh, Kingston Frontenac uh, fan. <laughs> All right, so let's let's do that. Let's talk about Shane Wright. Um, of all the writers that contributed, uh, I don't really want to give away everyone's list, but I will say that uh, all the writers had him ranked number one, including myself, with the exception of you. You're the only one that, that didn't have him number one, not to put you on the hot speed seat here too much, but uh, um, I guess defend that mentality to me. Um, 
do, do you think he's going to go number one in the draft? Uh, and that's that's just, a, I, I guess, a yes or no. And then why you don't like him for number one in fantasy, if, regardless of what the answer number one is. I don't want to put you on the hot seat, but I'm going to. But I'm going to. But I did. <laughs> um, I warned yeah. you that was coming before we started. Though. Yeah. No, I <laughs> when I when I and everyone can know this. Uh, I didn't even put him two, three or four. So there you go. You can call me crazy. Um, but the, it really comes down to the, yes, I, I do think he'll go first overall. And I think he probably should go first overall in the NHL draft. He, he is a really good player. And I agree with you. He's going to be, he's going to be a top six center probably for a decade or more. His value to an NHL team is going to be tremendous. He's a, he's a really good player. Um, unless someone picks Nemich because they want a defenseman, that's the only way I can see him not going number one. Uh, so it kind of depends on who lands that pick, of course, but uh, I think it's a really good chance and he probably should go first overall. Why not for fantasy? Well, he's, and, and this is again, points only fantasy. Now, if we're talking about, I have, I have a league where, you know, face-off wins, takeaways, um, hits, blocks, there's a lot of categories that kind of represent actually being good at hockey and in that league, I would take Shane Wright probably because his impact overall is going to be tremendous because he's going to play probably in all to most situations. He's an excellent two-way player. He's going to score points. I don't know. It's going to be, like you said, a ton of points. I don't know if he's an 80 you know, point per game player, but, uh, but he's, he's really, really good. But in a points only format, I could just really see him being like a, you know, um, Sean Couturier type or a Bo Horvat type, right? Like good two-way pivot, works their way up from like a 3C to, I mean, at this point, you'd say, yeah, I'll take those guys. But how long did it take those guys to be really fantasy relevant? It took a long time. And then probably the people who drafted them did not, do not still roster them, right? Unless it's one of those leagues where you just keep everyone forever and no one ever traded them, which is probably kind of unlikely. So that's part of the reason for me for right, because I just don't know that the upside is going to be that quick for him to get to 70 plus points. I also think that he's so good two way that he's probably going to get early two way assignments. You know, he's going to get more matchups and that's hard. to It's hard to score, right? It's hard to score when you're getting defensive zone starts, when you're getting matched up against the other team's best players. So I just think it's going to be a little hard on him and there's going to be a lot of expectations. So that's going to be a little tricky, a little bit easier for some of the wingers, you know, some of the guys like Kamel Nazar, maybe Slavkovsky, those guys might be able to, you know, play with a really strong center, play in a more offensive situation and get higher points upside a little bit sooner. So that's, that's the reason for me. It's not that I don't like Shane Wright. I certainly don't want that to be the narrative because I do. I, I, I would be so happy if, if my team took him, right? Or, if, you know, the team that I rooted for. Um, hey, the Sharks could use uh, Shane Wright. That would be cool. Uh, but it won't happen. But, yeah, he, he's just uh, – and I think I mentioned in my little comment, if, if you're looking back five years from now, who's the best fantasy asset from this draft? Is it Shane Wright or is it the field? I'm going to take the field because there's way more options, right? And someone may just come out of nowhere and put up a lot of points. And again, this is points only. Once you start adding other things, uh, other categories, um, I think that that gap narrows dramatically. Well, those are interesting thoughts. And this, I went to the top prospects game in Kitchener and ran into a lot of, a lot of writers there. Some of the contributors to this, to this rankings as well. And uh, to a man, all of them asked me, what's you're in Kingston. You see Shane Wright all the time. What's the deal? Uh, so I talked a lot about Shane Wright that night. Um, and my answer was pretty much the same all over. Um, he's very good. He's going to go first overall. And I think that because he has been a relevant prospect in the scouting community conversation for years now, um, before he got the exceptional status, people were talking about him. Then he received the OHL exceptional status. Um, and he was dynamite for Canada at the U18s uh, last year. So everyone's expecting him to come out of the gates on fire this year for Kingston. And he's been, he's been very good. 
right? Like he's over a point a game player for the Frontenacs, um, but he's not leading that team in scoring. He's not even second or third. I think he's like fourth on his own team in scoring. Uh, so there's a lot of concern there. And I think quite, quite frankly, the beginning of the year was he was a little slow coming out of the gate. And, you know, I think that the COVID layoff hit some players harder than others. And you know, maybe, maybe that's what was going on there. Uh, he's doing really well right now. He's been kind of hot lately. Um, so overall, my thoughts on Shane Wright are, I think he's worth being the first overall pick. And, but I think he's, people are having a hard time figuring out where to value him, not where to rank him necessarily, but where to value him because he had the exceptional status because he's been a name in, in, in the focus for so long. He's not a Connor McDavid. Yeah. He's, he's just not going to be that kind of player. And that's, who the hell is right. There's very few of those guys. <laughs> no. uh, other players that have received a sessional status, like John Tavares, Matthew Stamkos. I don't even know if he's going to be quite that good, but a player he gets compared to a lot is Patrice Bergeron because he plays that two way game, right? And he's good offensive. He's super reliable defensively he's strong on draws. He just does everything really well, right? Like he's maybe not a, a 10 out of 10 in any one category, but he's no lower than an, an eight anywhere. Uh, so does that make him a franchise McDavid type player? No, not really. Uh, does that make him a first line NHL player? Yes, I believe he will be. And I think the interesting thing about the Patrice Bergeron comparison is what would Patrice Bergeron be if he played in Arizona? Not a 70 point player, right? Not if he's not playing with Brad Marchand and pasta then he's not putting up 70 points a season consistently, you know? So if you took McDavid and put him between those two guys, he'd still score over a hundred points. Maybe who knows how many points he could get playing on, on a line that dynamic. Right. Um, so I think for Shane Wright and his fantasy value, a lot of it will have to do with who drafts him and what are his line mates going to be uh, in the next couple of years for the next couple of years after that. I think that'll be a, a huge factor. What what's around him, uh, and if it's if it's a desert oasis of nothing <laughs> in Arizona, unless they you know load up a whole bunch of super prospects and they all come of age at the same time in like the next two years, then you know I'm a little nervous about about how his fantasy upside is is going to go, but. Um, you know, because we don't know that he's got bad teammates. We don't know where he's going to go. Maybe he'll be centering Cole Caulfield in Montreal. That ain't so bad, right? With Josh Anderson on the other wing. All mm-hmm. right. You know, all right. Yeah, you've got something there. Anderson's got the speed. He's got the size. Caulfield's got the finish. And Shane Wright has the everything else. That would be a pretty dynamite mix, right? That would be a best case scenario for, for Wright, perhaps. Um, so without that known piece of the puzzle in, in place, I got to give him the benefit of the doubt and, and rank him number one for fantasy value as well. And, until I'm shown otherwise, basically, because I think if he gets in the right situation, he could be really good. Maybe not right away. Um, a lot of players going into the NHL out of the draft in the last couple of years have been kind of struggling a little bit. You know, everyone's expecting Lafreniere to be an 80 point player out of the gate. And he wasn't, uh, he might end up being, uh, I think we'll see something similar from Wright. I don't think he'll have that offensive expectation on him right away. I think that the expectation and the role that the coaches will give him will be just play your game, be a good all around player, play defensively, be a team guy, get your feet wet in the league. And then, you know, th- the points will come. Uh, so that's kind of, that's kind of my long answer on, on Shane Wright. Um, Cause a lot of people have been asking me, all right, so uh, the next player ranked on the list uh, was Logan Cooley. Uh, so let's talk about him. Logan Cooley's coming out of the U.S. national program. Uh, he ranked 29 points. Uh, so he's kind of, kind of, at, at this stage, I'd say he's he was the clear number two, and there's a not a huge drop off after that, but there's a bit of a drop off. And, and then the next couple of guys are all ranked pretty evenly. Um, so what's your take on uh, Logan Cooley? Yeah, Logan Cooley is super fun. 
to watch. He's, he's one of these guys. I, I think most people would say the motor is one of his, one of his things. I mean, I think in, in some ways he's not unlike Shane Wright, right? I mean, he's a, he's, he's definitely, like you said earlier, some centers are not going to be center at the next level, but I think, I think Wright and Cooley will be right. So um, Cooley is most likely going to be a center and he's, he's just one of these, uh, you know, guys whose motor never stops going. He's super smart. He's a good skater. Like all of his, all of his skills are good. None of them are like exceptional or excellent, right? He doesn't have like the best shot or, you know, necessarily the most amazing playmaking. He doesn't make these highlight real passes, but he never gives up on plays. He's dogged on pucks. He's really tough to play against, pain in the butt to play against. And I think coaches are going to put him out there in every situation, right? And I think that like Shane Wright, he's going to um, possibly get the short end of some deployment because they might give him more D zone starts and stuff like that. And, and maybe not the best wingers because he can drive play on his own. So that's a slight concern, but I, I just really, I really like him. I think a lot of his skills are, are highly projectable to the next level. And I think that, uh, you know, maybe he'll get a few extra points, uh, you know, scoring into empty nets and, and power plays and things like that. So I really like him. A lot of his uh, numbers are, uh, in terms of like NHL equivalency, he's actually right there with right. I guess technically one percentage point ahead, but very similar in terms of like what uh, what we might expect from them. So I really I like Cooley. He's, he's a definitely um, uh, different, a slightly different type of player, but in kind of a similar mold uh, to right. I guess you could say, and and highly highly projectable to the next level, which is something you definitely want in terms of like high risk, high reward players. He's kind of a he's kind of a um, you know, low risk, medium reward, I guess you might say for, uh, in terms of your fantasy draft. Well, I like those, those odds, low risk, high reward. That's exactly what you're looking for, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I think, I don't, I feel like none of these guys are like super, like going to be for sure top line players. Right. So you're looking for those guys who could pop and who could be up there. Right. So that's, yeah. And, and, there is certainly a, an amount of safety in your pick that you want, right? You don't want your top five pick to like never barely play in the NHL. And uh, that's not going to be the case for Cooley, I don't think. All right. So the guy that I had ranked second overall is the guy that you had ranked first overall. Let's talk about him because we're obviously both pretty keen on him. That's uh, uh, Joachim Kemmel or Joaquin Kemmel. I'm not sure how, how he pronounces his first name. There's a couple different ways you can say it. Uh, so he's a, you know, he's a, he's a playmaking forward. He's got a pretty good shot. Um, he's playing in the, in the Liga as a 17, 18 year old. Um, why do you have him? Why do you have him as your number one guy? Well, when I submitted my list, he was uh, doing a bit better than, uh, than now. He's definitely hit a bit <laughs> of a wall. Um, but Kemmel is, you know, he, he's got like a 50, 50 shot of being basically a star first line forward. And that's pretty great. Uh, you know, he, he's comparable to Patrick Line in his, in his draft season, not that he's the same kind of player, cause he's definitely not. Um, well, for one thing, he's better defensively. Um, but he's also pretty young, which is, you know, not always that important, but, uh, he's played most of this entire league uh, season in the league as a 17 year old, which is, which is impressive. And at the time I submitted my rankings to you, he had point per game um, points per game mark better as in, in that in a draft season than Patrick Line, Pulley Yarvi, Miko Rantanen, Sebastian Ajo, Rupe Hintz, Toy Ruterevinen. Those are some pretty elite names. Now I'm not saying he's going to be better than those guys, but that's that's pretty substantial that he was able to do that. He currently sits. At that time, he was seventh in points per game mark in Liga as a draft eligible. He's currently 15th, so he's fallen back a little bit, but he's still ahead of Pugliarvi, Kakaniemi, Rantanen, um, Teravine, and Ajo. So that's that's pretty remarkable, um, hints even. So he's he's got a really good shot, and he doesn't just hang out on the periphery to deliver his shot, which like that's what some guys do, like, like Line as well, right? He tends to just kind of, you know, be on the periphery a little bit and, and uncork his shot, which for him is so elite that, you know, he can get away with that because uh, it's it's so good. But Kemmel is, is basically, um, 
sort of similar in that he likes being on that um, that left dot, the OB spot. He's right-handed, and so he likes to unload that one-timer. But he does score from in front of the net. He scores from right in front of the net. He scores from, uh, you know, just outside the circles and all that. So he's a pretty exciting player. He's a very smart player. Uh, I wouldn't say he's good defensively, but he's he's capable and he provides effort. Um, and that's going to help him, you know, not not uh, get get benched like Lane has probably as often. Uh, and so, I mean, the one issue is that I, he's a little bit smaller. I mean, he's 5'11". He's not that small, but he's uh, slightly undersized. His skating isn't the best, but he's one of those guys that's just so smart. He knows where to be. He just finds that stop spot and then uncorks that shot. It's like, whoa, scoring chance, just like that, right? So he needs to play with someone who can get him the puck because he's not going to be the guy that carries it up into the zone, you know, gets around guys and uh, and sets other people up. He can make plays, but he needs someone else to kind of do some of the dirty work to get it in the zone, get it set up, uh, and then he can be, um, you know, provide some some offense. Not not terribly unlike Rontanen, you know, Rontanen has a great shot, but he's also a pretty good playmaker, but he's not, he's not the one carrying the puck in, you know, he lets McKinnon do that, but pretty, pretty great to be able to let someone like Nathan McKinnon do your dirty work, right. And get the pucks in for you. Yeah. He's, he can make players look good. Um, All right. So he's in a, in this, the third tier, I would say you've got right clear cut number one, and you got Cooley in with a little bit of space between a bumper between uh, first and third. And then the third, fourth, fifth ranked players on the consensus are all right in the same, like a couple of points, you're, you know, fine hair. Um, so we just talked about Kemmel and the next two in this tier are Yuri Slavkovsky and Matt Savoy. Uh, Savoy, I just, I just watched him play at the top prospects game. That's the first time I've seen him live. Uh, I so much love watching players play live than, than on video or, or highlights. Love what I see of Savoy in the highlights. Um, I wasn't super impressed with him at the top prospects game. I don't know if it was a bad game for him, for his standards. I definitely see some skill there, but I'm just concerned about his um his size and his ability to read the plays it was a fast paced game right like this was a very high skill level game and you know there there was a lot for me to watch in this game to take in and you know i didn't have the benefit of replays cuz i was there live but that's something that I, that i noticed that he didn't seem to be ahead of the play at any time he was relying on his on his skill almost all the time uh, so I, I, not a, a Matt Savoy expert, but those are my concerns that I had with him. Uri Slavkovsky, uh, he became a pretty household name after his performance, uh, leading the Olympics in, in scoring, uh, became a bit of a, a, a prospect darling after that point, uh, leading Slovakia, uh, in the, is it Slovakia or Chechnya? Anyway. Slovakia, he's Slovak, he's Slovak. Slovak. Okay. Sorry. I, their names are all like, I can tell the difference between Finnish and Swedish names, but you know, <laughs> the, the Slovaks and, and Czechs are, are a little bit similar. Uh, so anywho, those guys are all right in the wheelhouse. You had uh, Slavkowski ranked re- uh, decently. You, you scored him seven, but you had Savoy Dion at 13. So I think you're kind of poo-poo him on him as, as I am. Uh, what do you like and dislike about those guys real quick? Well, first of all, on Slavkovsky, if this were a categories ranking, he would be, I would have a hard time not putting him number one. Let's just say that he's phenomenal and, and yeah, so fun to watch. Um, he's, he's going to be, he's going to be remarkable. So your Slavkovsky, absolutely super fun to watch and is going to be one of those category stuffers, right? Like he's, he's, doesn't have all the numbers yet because he's playing kind of down the lineup in a, in a men's league, but Oh boy, we saw what he can do against his peers in the Olympics and he's phenomenal. And he's, he's definitely a guy. He's huge and he uses his physicality. I mean, he's, uh, you know, like half a hit per game over a block per game. Um, and he shoots a fair amount. So he's, he's a guy that I'm excited about in the multi-category league. I'm not sure about the points, which is why I had him at seven. It's just hard to tell because he hasn't had all the opportunity, right. In terms of what he's doing with his, with his club team. Um, But 
high enough on him that, you know, you see a guy with soft hands, good skills, knows what knows how to get to the shooting position, can shoot well, and he's six foot four, that guy is going to get opportunity all day long in the NHL. So like that about Slavkovsky, frankly, there's not that much to dislike about him. He's just a, he's a great player, super smart too. Um, Savoy is a very interesting case. Of course, we're seeing his brother Carter tear it up at University of Denver uh, right now. And, um, hasn't grown which doesn't mean that Matthew won't but being 5'9 and the fact that his brother is three or four years older than him and is also still 5'9 um, probably doesn't bode super well for Matthew getting bigger um, which is a concern uh, because I mean he's he's one of these centers that's probably not going to be a center though in the NHL like if anything he'll be a, he'll be a winger um, but there's there's issues with his game he he the way he plays in junior um, Especially, you know, we had um, we had we had Joel Henderson on our podcast, who follows the WHL very closely, and he pointed out some very concerning um, habits for Savoy. One of the one of the things is that he um, he doesn't he he sort of uh, panics a little bit, I guess you might say, when there's lack of space for him, which is like a gigantic red flag, right? Because if if you don't make great decisions when you're, when you're pressed in the CHL, good luck doing that against professionals, right? Especially when you're smaller and you should be, that should be your best asset, escaping trouble, being able to skate really well, um, you know, escape moves, things like that. Like that's what small guys need to be able to do because they're not going to put their body between them and the opposition and protect the puck. Right. So they have to be really good at those other things. So there's some, big concerns there with Savoy. I'm not sure that his game is, is, is NHL, you know, caliber just in those senses, which, uh, you know, is sounds crazy to say for someone who's put up as many points in junior as he has, but there are definitely guys who had trouble transitioning to the pros. Right. And so I tried to not disrespect him too much by dropping him out completely out of the, you know, top 20, but my ranking is basically saying I'm not getting this guy and I'm okay with it. And I, because I have concerns about his play projecting to the NHL. And uh, I'd rather just not take someone that risky because the upside is, is huge. You know, the, the points per game are, are fantastic. His star potential is you know, 38%, um, you know, comparables to Braden point, but uh, go back and listen to our episode 174. Um, Joel breaks down pretty clearly why he is not Braden point and why he, he has, concerns about uh, Matthew, Matthew Savoy's translatability to the NHL so that was a big influence for me I went back and checked a lot of the things he said and I was like oh yeah I, I see some. I mean part of it's maybe you see what someone tells you to look at so maybe there's some confirmation bias there but I, I trust Joel a lot and I uh, I think there's some some merit to what he's saying and you guys are so lucky to be able to to see all the junior hockey up there I don't I don't have that opportunity so I have to rely on what uh, other people see firsthand and what I can see on the video yeah, Joel's uh he's a Dauber Prospects alumni, so we got all the time in the world for Joel and uh and we know exactly how how good he he is at assessing talent. He uh he's identified a couple of, of good players coming out of the dub for us over the years. Um and he's been a guest on this podcast too. Uh he's really big on Jager Fergus and we'll get to him. Uh so can't talk about every player on the list because this would be an hours long podcast uh so just kind of skipping down a little bit uh we've got the top five already done here then i had frank nazar and and daniel yurov uh jonathan lekermiaki was those are the next guys on the consensus rankings and you get all the way down to number nine before the first defenseman uh was ranked and that's simon nemich which I was a little surprised. I had to do a double check on the math to make sure that I didn't miss scoring someone somewhere because I didn't think that he would be the number one ranked defenseman for uh, for fantasy, but uh, he is. And then, I mean, you had him ranked pretty high. You had him six. And then the next ranked guy, uh, Skip Brad Lambert. And then the next ranked defenseman is David Yurichek. And you had him ranked, I think, second, very high. 
so let's talk about the defense for a little bit here. Those two specifically, those two are top of all of the the NHL draft rankings. Those are the top two ranked D, I think, unanimously, right? I haven't looked at a lot of the rankings lately, but I'm pretty sure those guys yeah. are at the at the top. Um, so let's talk about the differences in in their game a little bit. Uh, and uh, obviously, you like one better than the other for for fantasy purposes. So I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I had David Yidichek second, and uh, consensus had him at eleven. There, there's so I mean. There's so much to like about him. And unfortunately he got injured like right away at that abbreviated world championship, really bad knee injury. And he's missed most of the rest of the season. So we haven't really been able to see him progress from, from the 11 points in 29 games he had for, uh, I'm not going to try to say the team name, but the Chechia um, club team he plays for. And he's just a, he's a, he's an offensive defenseman, which is what you want to fantasy. Right. Uh, you know, the the main concern is that, well, are we taking an offensive defenseman who can't play defense? And uh, I don't think that's the case with Yeti Check. He's, he's not going to win Norris trophies unless uh, unless the caliber of defensive play Brent Burns style of uh, Norris trophy winners. And then, then maybe because uh, uh, I don't think that uh, Burns really won it for that reason. But it's really an offensive defenseman award. And that's that's what he is. He's very good at jumping in the play, picking his times, great skater. Um, he's got he's got a good shot and he's he's just exactly what you want in terms of, in terms of that. Um, And I think one of the, one of the reasons why I wanted to put him so high is that I think he's going to fall. He's going to fall because we haven't seen him play for half a year and the draft's going to come. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's, there's a recency bias at at drafts for sure. Just look at the, uh, at the first pandemic draft when the KHL started and all those Russian players went because they were playing. They were playing. Yeah, exactly. And and I think that's going to happen here in um, reverse, in reverse. And people, well, I think an NHL team, it's, I think he's probably going to slide a little bit, maybe, maybe even into the teens, uh, but um, po- out of the top 10 possibly. And if that happens, everyone in your fantasy drafts are going to fade him as well. Right. Especially because a lot of people fade defense, but I, he's a guy I think that you could get you know, a little bit later, maybe with a, depending if you have like a 14 team league, a, a mid to late first round pick, and he could be like the best guy in this draft. Right. Cause we just haven't, we don't know. We haven't seen enough. Uh, but yeah, I really, really like you to check. Uh, he's, he's got some really great instincts, dynamic skater. And uh, that, that Chechia league is uh, depending on which NHL equivalency you follow. It's, it's one of the toughest in the, in the world. Um, you know, Patrick Bacon's data suggests it's like the third hardest, um, some of the other equivalency models have it like fourth or fifth, but either way, it's a tough league. And so putting up that, the points that he has, uh, has been pretty impressive. And Nemec, on the other hand, is, is just your all around stud. You know, he's a, he's, he's an all around defenseman. He's, he's got probably more offense than some people give him credit for. I don't think he's going to be better offensively than, than Yitichek, but He's going to be one of those guys. Nemesh is going to be one of those guys who's going to be out there and you're not going to question what situation you play him in, right? He's, you're going to be comfortable putting him out uh, pretty much, you know, whatever's going on, you're up, you're down. Um, not like saying he's Mo Sider, but kind of that mold where, you know, you, you can just kind of put him out there no matter what's going on and be pretty comfortable with with that. And and his equivalency is super high because he's been, uh, you know, he's been really, doing great um and for the slovak league there of course that equivalency is a little bit lower the slovak league but he's been he's been doing tremendous things there so um i but i do think that nemic is going to be more of an all-around guy which is always a, a bit you know concerning in terms of fantasy because sometimes those guys don't always you know put up that many points and unless you unless you want unless you need like all the peripherals I mean, it's pretty unusual to see a guy like what's happening with Cider coming in pretty early and just putting up monster perf numbers, right? So that's going to be unlikely. And then, so you might just have to wait. But I do think he, I do think Nemich is a guy who could be in that mold of just putting in a lot of peripherals. But this ranking wasn't based on that. It was just based on points. So that's right. why I had Nemich at six, which is a little bit lower. But again, the value over replacement of a decently high point producing defender 
is uh, in my mind better than some of these meh forwards that may be, you know, maybe a second liner, but more likely a third liner. Well, another defenseman who would have been ranked a little higher if I did my if I did my rankings and posted this article after the top prospects game would be um, Benton Metzajek. I was really impressed with how he played at the top prospects game when I got to watch him play live. That guy wants the puck all the time. Uh, And he's got a really nice blend of aggression for getting the puck, but not being overzealous and pulling himself out of position. And even the odd time where I thought, oh, there it is there where he was, he was chasing it a little bit too much and he, he overcommitted or, or went in behind the other team's net when he should be on the point kind of thing to try and get a puck retrieval. His skating is, is pretty good, man. Like he can be the first guy back to cover up for himself when he's, he's pinched in a little too far. And then when he does get the puck, he's not a, he's not a puck hog, right? Like he, he distributes it nicely. Um, he holds onto the puck for long stretches, uh, but he does look for, outlets and opportunities it's and and he drives it to the net consistently like he wants the puck and then when he gets it it's going to the other team's goal right away uh that translates really well to fantasy hockey right like someone who just drives the puck to the other team's net every chance he gets uh he had a really impressive game for me and overall he was ranked 17th in the third highest defenseman overall on the consensus rankings um i would have bumped him up on my rankings a little bit i'm a little bit ashamed about how low i had him you know that's only one game but you know still i was pretty impressed with what i saw uh another player that i was really in fact the player i was most looking forward to seeing where he slotted in in this rankings overall with a question was brad lambert he is one of the most polarizing prospects in this draft and you know, he ended up being 10th. So he cracked the top 10, which I wasn't sure if he was gonna. Um, but there's people that had him ranked inside their top five. And there's other people that had him ranked below 20. So he was really all over the map here. Um, I'm not really sure where I sit on him. If if this is a player who, if I have you know, a draft around the top 10 and he's on the board, how do I feel about taking this player? Um yeah, he's, he's just really had an underwhelming season and he changed teams and that didn't move the needle at all. That didn't change a thing. Uh, he's just produced very poorly this season in his draft year. Now we've seen in, in history, some other players have had really disappointing draft years and then rebounded nicely. Um, and some guys haven't. They just peaked way too early and and then were never able to continue their development. And they were the best player they were ever going to be at, at 17 years old kind of thing. What is your take on Brad Lambert? Would you draft him in your top 10? That really depends on my team and the situation and all that. But I do think that one thing I would say is that if you're not really sure who to take and you want someone with a pretty high upside, if you're anywhere after like, yeah, eight, nine, draft Brad Lambert because he absolutely could be one of the best guys in this draft. He also could continue to do what he's doing now and just kind of not put it all together. So it's, yeah, like you said, all over the place. And uh, I was trying really hard to move him up, but uh, I just couldn't because there's, it's, it's hard to go based on what you're seeing. And there was some guys that I just like a little bit better. Um, I do think he has, I mean, he's your boom bust from this draft. Absolutely. Like a guy who could just absolutely be great. And you, you could come back, out of this draft later, you know, kind of like Cole Caulfield going at 16 or whatever. Right. I mean, that was because he was small, but, um, but you could come back to this draft later. And I think, I think Lambert might go 15 plus. And then we're looking back later and saying, wow, how did that happen? Uh, well, this is why, because his draft season has been very confusing and and not even just his draft season, but other things as well. But if you look at his tournament play, he just looked remarkable you know, with his peers and his finished peers. And, and so, I mean, you you always try to not over rate those things, but it does matter. And, you know, maybe it's just context of these teams, but like you said, he changed teams and nothing changed, but uh, I don't know. It's really hard to pinpoint what's going on, but if you look at some of his micro stats, 
he is a phenomenal transition player. Like we know that about him. He's a phenomenal transition player. He has great skill. Maybe it's just like he needs the right situation. And it is possible that neither of these situations he's been in during his draft season were good, even though he changed them up. I mean, that's possible. You could also say, well, it's him because the situation changed and he still wasn't that good. I mean, both of those things are possible, right? Um, or either of those things, I should say. Probably not both at the same time. But uh, he is a guy who I would I would want to take a, a, a flyer on, depending on where I am in my league and my draft, because the upside is is very, very high. And especially after you get out of the top 10, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, meh, this guy could be a second liner, you know, or a top 4D. So yeah, let's take Brad Lambert, because why not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. I mentioned him a minute ago. Let's talk a little bit about Yager Furkus. Joel is really keen on this guy. I am too. This kid's just got a rocket of a shot and he had a really nice move at that top prospects game as well. And I was sitting next to uh, a team scout watching the game. And when he scored that goal, I think it was in the first period where he was coming up the wing and he had a defenseman to beat and he just made this nice little, uh, this nice little kind of drag curl move, got in uh, inside on the defenseman and then just ripped it far down. Um, he's not a big guy. He's pretty slight, but this is an example of what's the case. Okay, so he's small. What's, what does he bring? What's the context? Does that matter? What kind of game does he play? And he's, he's quick. Uh, he's like a little water bug out there. He can, he can accelerate quite nicely. He's got good speed as well as, as quickness. And his shot is, is NHL level. Like what the scout said to me when he scored that goal is he just kind of always like, that's an NHL goal right there all day long. And I was like, you goddamn right. It is. That was beauty. Just a little movie found to find the, just enough opening in time and space with a lane and didn't hesitate. His, his release was just a bullet. You know, it was, he was stick handling one second and it was in the net, the next. And if you blink, you missed it, but he shot it in between there. Uh, so that was one play. Uh, I've seen a couple highlight reels of him too. And you know, this is not, that's not an outlier that play he's doing these things on a, on a pretty regular basis. Um, you had Fergus ranked in your top 10 and he ended up being overall ranked 29th on the consensus ranking. So you're driving him up by ranking him eight overall. If you ranked him you know, 15th or whatever, he might not have made the the rankings. That's how low some of the other guys were on him. Uh, he pretty consistently ranked low. Uh, I had him ranked around the twenties. So I'm also thinking in hindsight now that that's probably a little low. If I went back and did it now, he'd be higher. So let's talk about Furcus. How come you had him number eight? Because he's so damn good. That's why. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I would say you're welcome to your readers and your yeah. listeners because he's someone I feel very strongly about. And he's, <laughs> yeah, if you can get Fergus, I mean, I'm just, this is where I kind of pray the guy slips, right? Like slip into the team so I can get you with like my second round fantasy pick, right? Um, that's probably not good for the actual player, but you know what I mean? It's like, I want even more value out of this guy. Cause he's just great. I mean, he's got a great shot, as you said, but also really good playmaker um, moves. Well, his skills are translatable to the NHL right now, even though he's small, he does, like you said, okay, he's a little smaller. What does he do? Well, he does a lot of things really well. And that is what makes him so fun because he is super skilled and he, but he, he doesn't really, um, he, you know, he, he does get knocked off the puck a little bit. So there's some size and strength issue there, but the way he changed, changes his angles on the shot, the way he kind of finds positions to get his shot away from the way he kind of finds lanes to pass to his uh, teammates, the way he kind of creates space for teammates by putting pucks into space. Like he is just so smart and good um, that I, I just, I love this guy. And I mean, he's not even 18 yet. He's still 17. So he's, you know, he's, he's got room to grow. He's, he's 
150. So he's tiny. Um, but he, he has, he has some room to grow and, and get stronger and bigger. Um, so that's going to help him a lot too, but yeah, he's, he's one of these guys that, um, that I think he'll fall because of his size. And I think this is a guy that you want to take with one of your later round picks, you know, maybe, maybe he isn't uh, as high as I ranked him, but if you could get him with a late first or second round pick, you're going to be laughing. Um, I think about a guy like Olin Zellweger last year that I had ranked, I think like 14th or 15th. And now in a redraft, how high does that guy go? Top five, maybe. I mean, he's, yeah, that's kind of what you can expect from someone like Furcus, maybe not quite to that level. Um, but he is, uh, he's a really fun player to watch and it's going to be fun to see him kind of develop. But uh, I think just in terms of value, he's a guy of tremendous value. Something you kind of touched on there. You hope that he falls down the draft rankings so that you can get him. That's a, that's an interesting point. A lot of people's draft research is they just look at the NHL draft board and see where were guys picked. Oh, that's the range. I'll take them then. So that's where a, a fantasy ranking, especially a consensus fantasy ranking like this one, can help you kind of cut through some of that BS, right? You see a guy drafted in the top 10, but he's a defensive specialist. You don't want him on your on your fantasy list. But then you have a guy like Fergus who's way down. And, you know, maybe scouts are a little gun shy to or GMs are a little gun shy to draft him because he's because he's so small or they have another concern or whatever. But if he over, you know, so he's a little weak. That's okay. What is he 17 years old? 18, maybe? I'm not sure when his birthday is, but he's either 17 or 18 years old. April. Right. So when I was his age, I weighed a buck 20 soaking wet. (laughs) So, but, you know, I'm pretty north of that now. Um, But that's interesting, right? There's, There's a lot of players who I see, and then the draft comes along. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get this guy in the second or fourth round of my draft. And then some NHL team goes and totally derails that, picks him in the first or second round. Uh, and there was one year where uh, two years ago, the three years ago, the last live draft, Carolina was doing that. And one of the scouts for Carolina lives in New Jersey. And I, so in the midway through the, the second day, I pulled him over and I said, Mike, can you guys stop using my my fantasy draft list because you're killing me <laughs> you're picking all my guys and you're picking them like so early I, I only have one first round pick i can't get all these guys anymore so could you you're killing me quit it yeah joke. <laughs> yeah we had to laugh about that i don't think you don't think he took my advice um all right so i don't know if you've got any other players you want to talk about i've got one more that i want to talk about and then we can cover off anyone else you want but that's ivan miroshenchenko uh I think you might even had an online chat about should I include him in my list or or am I not? Um, and the reason why is because he was recently diagnosed with um, some sort of cancer, not Hodgkin's lymphoma or something like that. I'm not a doctor. I don't really know what that means in terms of his um, career, his return to hockey or his life, his survivability. Uh, but it's certainly a red flag. He's going to miss some, some time. And then, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning of the show too. Then you throw the Russian factor onto there as well. It's going to get to be really difficult to understand what the Russian players contractual obligations are in the KHL. Um, I think I was listening to a podcast or a radio show about that. And they were saying that there's this like embargo on, on the KHL. So they're just like not talking anymore to the rest of the leagues and so there might be players who you want to draft out of russia and they might be under contract over there for one two three four five more seasons it's it could be really hard to tell it's you know unless the agent is is friendly with whoever it is that's looking to draft him that can be that can be a real problem and you know this could be going back to like the 1980s where NHL teams just wouldn't commit draft capital on Russian prospects because they just didn't know if they were going to be able to get them out of Russia. Like the, the players had to defect. So, you know, a lot of players that were drafted in the seventh round or, or later or not at all. There's more than seven rounds back in the day. Um, 
and now with what's going on with with the war between Russia and uh, Ukraine, who knows how long this is going to last and and how nasty this could get in terms of player transfers and and whatnot. So I think that's a real flag and that, you know, there's, we're talking about real life problems here and how they affect our fantasy league. So let's, let's not be unsensitive to the fact that, you know, there's people dying over there in the war and, and this is all these sanctions on Russia are, you know, like the players not being allowed to come over because they're Russian or not participate in the world juniors because of what their country's doing. That's, you know, that's pretty raw deal for these kids. They only get, some of them only get one shot at the world junior and now they're not going to get that because it was canceled for COVID and now it's, they're kicked out because their country's in, invading their neighbor, which has got nothing to do with them. But the reason why is, is it puts political pressure on Russia that, you know, like these sanctions are, are, problematic for your people quit it <laughs> cut it out where you know you're, you're pissing your own constituents off not that they vote over there um so anyways the russian factor to my point is it's reared its ugly head in a big big way i think um so what's your thoughts on on russian players in the draft overall and then miro shinchenko specifically because he's got you know the, the two big problems there yeah, I think you said it really well. Of course, we're sensitive to what's happening, and that that's a much bigger issue, and we feel for all that. Um, but we do have to consider how these things affect our, our fantasy drafts. And I think it, the, the first thing we're going to do is just see where these guys go in the NHL draft, because that is a legit issue this time around. I, I kind of agree with you that for a long time, there was this sort of fear of Russian players coming over and it it sometimes happened, but it, it usually wasn't as big of a deal. That's why Nikita Kucherov happened when he did. Um, and the Lightning got such a steal with him. But it is it is going to be an issue. And I, I think some of the top Russian players, you know, are going to are going to get faded a little bit by NHL teams. I think they're going to be legitimately concerned with right, is this player even going to be allowed to come over? You know, your Danila Yurov, uh, who's one of the top Russian prospects, uh, you know, he I don't know. Does he fall out of the first round? Does he fall at the end of the first round? I mean, who knows what depends on what's happening in the world? I think it's it's a legit concern, and for 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 fantasy GMs, I would just say you kind of have to think about what is your level of comfort. Are you comfortable taking someone like a Danila Yurov, and if he happens to not come over for three years or ever, is that okay? Is it going to kill your team, or is it going to be fine? And it, on the one hand, it could be a tremendous value if you take him with like a second round pick. And he comes over in two, three years and is great. That's tremendous value. Or if you take him with like a top 10 pick, you could have wasted a pick and not even get any games played out of him. So you kind of have to decide. For me, it's all about just where are you drafting? What is the level of comfort with your team? And what are you expecting out of that pick? Because if you're really expecting a lot and you really need that player to contribute, well, you might need to go in a different direction because there's so many questions about the Russian players. Uh, Marush Nashenko, who has Hodgkin's lymphoma, I, I saw this really great uh, video with um, with Lemieux talking to him about that because that's what he recovered from and kind of giving him pep talk. So it is certainly recoverable. It is going to take a long time if he if he can fully recover, which he, he can if, if everything goes well. It sounds like they caught it early enough. Of course, they don't tell you all the details, but um, you know he's certainly not going to be playing competitive hockey for a while. So I'm not exactly sure what, what teams are going to do, whether he's even going to go this year. Um, maybe he just falls down a lot, or maybe uh, maybe they wait until next year. I, I think someone's going to take him. But he's a guy who, if he does get taken, like say maybe in the second or third round and someone takes a flyer on him, again, same same conversation, but that could be a remarkable pick because Maroshenko is, I think, clearly a top 20 player in this draft, maybe even top 15, depending on, how you how you rank things um so he again he could be a tremendous value if uh if everything kind of goes right and he does fully recover and start playing again but certainly not someone that I would want to take with um with a high expectation pick you know what I mean yeah that's you just answered the question I was about to ask you too like imagine if Russia hadn't invaded any other countries and he hadn't been diagnosed with a life-threatening disease how high could he be ranked in this consensus ranking and 
I'm sitting here thinking pretty close to top 10. Like he could push Brad Lambert out of that top 10 position. Um, because he's just a super skilled player. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. So, uh, Victor, that's pretty much all the players that I, I specifically wanted to hit on and have a, a little conversation about. Uh, I, I encourage everyone who's who's listening, if you've enjoyed this episode, go back and and also listen to uh, the last episode of Fantasy Hockey Life. Um, you can find them on Twitter at Fan Hockey Life as well. And they talk, uh, Victor and your co-host talk a little bit more about this. And then if, obviously go to Dauber Prospects. Uh, it's on the homepage. Um, it's a feature article. If you're not listening to this uh, at the end of March, when I'm we're recording this on, on March 28th, if it's been a couple of weeks or whatever, it might've scrolled off the homepage. Uh, you can sort the articles there by, uh, it's under the features article section. Uh, so you can you can scroll back and and find it there. Are there any other players that you wanted? You had some some pretty strong positive or negative fantasy impact opinions about that we haven't touched on that you want to circle around on? Uh, I mean, just the other one is is probably uh, well, I guess maybe two just quick ones. Connor Geeky is another like Savoy. I think is is one that I would I just I'm going to stay away from. I think there there are question marks about how he plays and translatability so I faded him quite a lot I consensus had him at 12 and I'm at 21 so I'm, I'm just a little concerned about geeky and and uh whether what he's doing in junior can translate as he moves up uh he's gonna have to really change how he plays uh and then the other one is Frank Nazar I just think Frank Nazar is so fun to watch and he's a guy who could surprise and and we all had him kind of in that four five six range it wasn't anything too surprising but um he's fun and he might, he might fall a little bit, you know, it's going to be just really like, it's it's hard to talk about them now because we don't know where they got drafted and it really matters in terms of where they got drafted and who, who might, uh, uh, where, you know, where the, where the value is, but he's a guy who could fall a little bit potentially because he is, you know, five ten a little bit shorter. Um, he is high skilled and, and kind of a little bit of a risk reward prospect, but I just, I love watching Frank Nazar and I think he could be, looking back one of the top five players in this draft, uh, especially for fantasy. Yeah. That's one of the, the comments each writer got it wrote, not on every player, but there's a couple of comments on each player from a couple of the writers and on the Frank Nazar one, uh, Russ Cohen said that he's one of those players that pundits will look back on when they redraft 2022 and decide that too many teams passed on him and then wonder how did that happen? He's that good. Um, so he had him ranked pretty high. I had him ranked pretty high. I think everyone pretty much had him in their, in their top 10 at least. He's ranked sixth overall in the consensus rankings. Um, so yeah, he, he's a player that's probably not going to slide too far down on, on draft day. All right. Well, let's put a bow on this episode, Victor. Thanks very much for joining me. And again, everyone can follow Victor on Twitter at VictorNuno12, V-I-C-T-O-R-N-U-N-O-1-2. And uh, the podcast that he's on is at Fan Hockey Life. Uh, It's on, well, it's on Apple Podcasts. That's what I listen to. I'm sure it's on other platforms as well. Um, so thanks, Victor, for joining me. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want, at Farling, P-H-A-R-L-I-N-G. And uh, go check out those fantasy rankings for your draft. And, and on behalf of everyone who is listening, uh, I just want to say thanks, Victor, for uh, ranking Yager Furkus as high as you did. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It was so much fun. All right. We'll have you on again, pal. Hope so.